All right, so let's talk Mets. The, you know, the state of the franchise, we're just getting yo-yoed all over the place at this point. You know, A-Rod and J-Lo are in. A-Rod and J-Lo are out. A-Rod and J-Lo are back in. You know, and it's just, just buy the goddamn team already. And if you if you wonder what kind of organization or fran- uh, the Mets are, there was that news item. This is not recent. This was like maybe last week. A minor leaguer. So the minor leaguers are really, since this coronavirus thing has happened and the league, the, the seasons have been suspended, the minor leaguers, I mean, the major leaguers are getting hosed by the owners who refuse to give them their due pay. The minor leaguers are really screwed where they're just getting – there's just hardly any pay there whatsoever. It's like the equivalent of being unemployed, which I guess, what did they say, 25% of people are, are unemployed? Jesus. 41 million, I think. Did I hear that? Whew. And and somehow I'm not one of them. I, I probably will be very soon, <laughs> given what's going on at work, but uh, uh, shoes on the other foot. Ah, oh, Jesus, Neil. Um, so a minor leaguer who was released by the Mets was like, ah, finally, now I can get, rip into you via uh, a notes a notes screenshot <laughs> on Instagram or Twitter, I forget which. But uh, he ripped into the Mets organization, um, criticizing them for signing Team Tebow. <sighs> From a business standpoint, I think I understand it, you know? If your minor league sick, t- sick, uh, ticket sales are slumping, bring in someone like Tebow. His ticket sales go up. There's more attention, more merch, more money, more revenue. But then you, someone who might be more deserving of that spot loses their roster spot. Totally get that. And a lot of people said it's a, it's a stunt, and it was, you know. But there was an outside chance. There was an outside chance that. He's touched by the hand of God like he was in that one season, in that one playoff game in the NFL. Was it 2011? And just goes off and, and somehow makes, makes it to the majors. And I mean, can you imagine if he made it to the majors? Wow, what that would have been like. Oof. Um, so he ripped the organization for that, but then he also rip, rips them for their toxic culture. And... I I mean I I have to you know he, it sounds like the ramblings or the rant of a a bitter you know the a bitter partner after a split after a divorce talking shit about their former lover from our partner but I almost have to agree with them you know given everything that's happened and given what they do to their players and you know I think uh if you if you follow we got to believe the uh the um podcast Mets podcast from KFC and Clem I mean, they have a whole, they did a whole like March Madness tournament of painful Mets memories. I think SNY did it and maybe the fan did it as well. I mean, there's like, take your pick. There's been well over 64 painful, just stupid, mind boggling moves by this organization. Um, and I think what his specific example was uh, Something going on with his arm, or he's just coming back from Tommy John, or he's just coming back from injury. He pitches in a game, minor league double A game, um, and is immediately flown after the game to across the country to a game where he's asked to pitch that night or the next day. And it was just like they just the organization just mistreats its minor league players, mistreats its players. You know, there was a classic example of like letting Ryan Church fly cross country with a concussion, which is like a major no no red flag. Um, so this is nothing new, but hopefully, you know, with new ownership, they could hopefully imp- implement some changes that you know changes how they operate. Just be a big market ball club <laughs> that knows what they're doing. Um. I think, as I mentioned in the intro, I've been watching a lot of old Mets games. So, like, uh, the 2000, 2000 NLDS game four uh, against the the Giants. So, I, I remember I, in a previous episode, I was talking about how game, I 
that was game the clinching game of game five of NLCS 2000 NLCS versus the Cardinals when Mike Hampton put on a goddamn show people forget and I'm one of those people I definitely forgot 2000 was kind of hazy for me I mean it was college it was the fall uh you know I was you know uh, 19 still not 20 as a junior try to wrap your head around that and you know hanging out with freshmen in the freshman dorms because there was a freshman girl who was actually older than me <laughs> who I was trying to uh woo I guess obviously did not work and um so yeah that was just a oof. so that was hazy a lot of 40s floating around but Bobby Jones wow dude that game four, eight of nine innings were perfect. So I think it was like maybe the first inning, he allowed some shit to go on, but then eight perfect innings. Bobby Jones. For some reason, flash in the pan comes into my mind, but I don't, I don't view him as a flash in the pan. I mean, I obviously wish that he put up, you know, he was able to put up more than a few seasons of, uh, of good numbers, but. If you if you haven't watched, I think it was a YouTube premiere, so uh, it might be they might have archived it on YouTube. But if not, try and try and try and dig and search for it because uh, if you're into pitching like I'm into pitching, that Bobby Jones performance is one of the all times. And uh, holy shit, if he threw a perfect game in the in the playoffs for the Mets, the Mets hadn't had a no hitter yet. We I mean still technically don't have a no hitter because I giant, you know. It's the eighth anniversary of Yo- of Johan Santana's no hitter, the Nohan. <sighs> Just uh, I don't know, kind of bittersweet. Anyway, I watched the Mets. Uh, another, I think this was another YouTube premiere. I watched the Mets clinch the nineteen eighty eight NL East, and uh, I think it was against the Phillies. B- by the way, those eighties, the like eighties Phillies uniforms, interesting color combination scheme. And uh, even though I, I hate Philadelphia and, and the filthies, um, I don't know. Something about that look. Kind of groovy, man. Anyway, this was like the beginning of the Greg Jeffries era. I hate to use the word era because it's like he was only there for a few years. But he was, I guess he might have been 19 in 87, which was his, technically his first year where he had statistics but i think his first rookie year was 88 maybe when he was 20 anyway um there was a i mean i kind of really liked greg jeffries because i mean i was what seven eight nine when he started to hit his stride and i remember reading an article about his dad would have him swing uh like a bat underwater and so we had a pool in the backyard, and so I would go back with like a wiffle bat, and I'd go on the go underwater in the pool and swing the bat, and um, I guess it helped me. I don't know. Didn't become a pro, but um, man, that Greg, the Greg Jeffries saga. Let me see if I can scroll down and if I pasted anything here. I mean, basically, what happened with with Jeffries was uh, he was fucking hated in the clubhouse because he was this young upstart rookie who didn't act like a rookie, and that's just a no go, especially in the in eighties baseball culture, eighties you know locker rooms, clubhouses. You just you need to take your lumps as a rookie, and and Jeffries refused to do it, and so he would get you know he needed his own. He wouldn't want his bat to be with like the other. Players' bats. I mean, the, the, it was a New York Post article, so um, definitely do like New York Post Greg Jeffries search, and it should pop up. But you'll see, like, he would get shit from like Hernandez, McDowell, uh, just about everyone from top to bottom. All the veterans were just like hated this guy because he just did he didn't he didn't con- he didn't conform. But the the I think the the theme of the article was like if Greg Jeffries played in today's game like none of that would have been an issue. None of what he did would would have been an issue. And so they interviewed him. 
and I guess this was the first time that Jeffries has speaked out on it, sp- spoken about it. And he's like, yeah, bygones are bygones. I deserved a lot of it. And I was also a young kid who whose best friend was his dad. So my dad had a huge influence over me. And um, I think, you know, even the guys that were hounding him and like, you know, hated him then were saying, yeah, it was unjust. It was not fair of us to to be so hard and difficult on Greg. Um, and then of course he went to the Phillies and he did, did he go to the Royals first and then the Phillies or Phillies and the Royals? But he was out, he went, he was done by like thir- age 30. So he had so much promise and I guess he just did, petered out maybe due to injuries. I'm not, I'm not sure, but that was interesting to watch. Cause it's like, here's this guy who can steal bases and is fast and is a switch hitter and, um, never hit for power but had a shit ton of doubles if you look at like his stats on baseballreference.com um he's a double machine and like if he yeah that was another part of the article was like well if he adjusted his launch angle um he would have hit way more home runs and then maybe he would be more valued as a asset i don't know dude 86 mets versus astros that championship series that was fun to watch those 86 Mets, dude. I mean, I know even the 88 Mets. I mean, the 88 Mets lost to the Dodgers and the NLC, NLCS, I think it was. But you look at the 87 Mets, they should have gone to the playoffs. You look at the 89 Mets, they should have gone to the playoffs. You look at the 90 Mets, they should have gone to the playoffs in the current playoff format system. Back then, it was like, I think it was top two. You know, NL East winner, NL West winner. You go to the championship series and then World Series. So there was no wild card. There was no division series. Whatsoever. But if there were, I mean, look at the 99-2000 Mets. They're not getting in in the old system, the old play on format, and the fucking 2000 Mets went to the World Series. So, um, God damn, what if, right? I was, I was, I was going to put together like – I mean, the Mets, the 80s Mets were a dynasty. I know you can't throw the D word on some team that only won once, and, and many people say they shouldn't even won that one World Series against the Red Sox, but I'm throwing the dynasty tag on them. I mean, they were they were so good, and they would have made the playoffs every year, and when you're in, who knows what happens. So, um, But that Mets-Astros series was interesting because it's like fucking Nolan Ryan is my age, Still throwing heaters, and then you, uh, uh, the Astros just had a bunch of big lumpy pitchers who threw gas, like just big oaf looking motherfuckers. And then you have Lenny Dykstra, who a young Lenny Dykstra, just like cocky as fuck. Um, even Keith, like looking at Keith and his approach to the game and and what he did, um. They had Aguilera, I think, at that point. Ronnie Darling, Wally Backman, Tuffle, Santana, Elster, Hojo, Knight, Mookie, Kevin Mitchell, Straw, and like Danny Heap, which I totally forgot about Danny Heap. That was like a, I just, I, I remember seeing his name on some rosters and I was like, oh yeah, Danny Heap. And like he had some crucial hits against the Astros. A lot of come from behind wins, late inning, extra inning wins. Never say die attitude. Um, Watched like uh, a bunch of games from the 86 World Series against the Red Sox. That like the game six when I think the Rocket, Roger Clemens, started at the age of like what, 21, 22, something like that. And was just mowing batters down. And then we somehow kept clawing and fighting against like Stan Stanley and whoever, Chiraldi or whoever that was in extras. And we're so familiar with the Mookie Wilson uh, uh, little bouncer down the line from, by the way, Vin Scully, Jesus Christ. Dodgers fans, you're so goddamn lucky to have him commentating every game. For some reason, I like, I actually liked Tim McCarver when I was young. And I know it's like sacrilege, it's a sin to say. But um, I don't know. I just liked McCarver. I just liked the sound of his voice. And I don't think he was as maybe as much of a doofus maybe with when he got older he just started to lose it and just like you know you watch like pat summer and john madden like in the 80s and it was like that was like peak they were just on point and then like they get into the 90s and it's just like Ugh. um 
<coughs> I think the same can be said for McCarver. I don't know. I liked McCarver. I liked him a lot. And then, I don't know, he just became, I think once he did that thing to Dion, he was like, he was on the outs for me. But you know, at that time, people were like taking his side over Dion's and it's just, you know, another case of the white man, black man. Okay. Um, but that, we're so used to Mookie's, just seeing that clip of Mookie swinging and the little bouncer down the line, it gets by Buckner. Like we're so used to seeing that. We didn't, we didn't see, we're not used to like that hole at bat. That hole at bat was insane. Like Mookie battling, fighting the wild pitch where Mitchell scores, Kevin Mitchell scores to tie the game. And then, you know, I mean, fighting foul ball after foul ball. And it, it really was, uh, cause I just watched, they just released Mookie's best moments on YouTube. And, uh, I mean, it was not all encompassing. I mean, they, they, they do this on, on YouTube where it's like the best, the greatest, the top. And then they only include certain things that they have like the actual footage for. <laughs> Cause I'm sure there was a bunch of, you know, great moments and plays. I mean, people forget and me, especially, I think it was in that game six game where I forget who hits it, but Mookie's in left because Dykstra's in center. And I think Jim Rice is coming around third, and Mookie, like, on the fly, laser beam frozen rope to, to Carter to end the inning when the Red Sox were already up, I think, 3-2. I mean, just huge. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of nostalgia. The, uh, the 98, uh, Mike Piazza's debut, so that was, I think, Memorial Day weekend. I watched that 98 game when they were playing the Brewers. Um, that 98 squad was interesting. Uh, but Piazza had, had the, I think, the double that extended into a triple, scored three runs or something like that. And, like, Jerry Seinfeld was in attendance. Um, so that was fun to watch. We had, we had like, Brian McRae. Bernard Gilkey, Butch Husky as her outfield. And then uh, Ordonez, Olerud, Alfonso, and fucking Bayerga, I think. And maybe Lighter was on the bump. God damn, I really wish that team won a World Series. Or Lighter. Lighter and Piazza, I think they they would deserve one. How about this little little bait clickbait article are Michael Conforto's Mets days numbered if he puts up more big numbers in 2020 the Mets could be could put a big asking price on a trade package next winter because of revenue losses expect more non-tenders than ever on of arbitration eligible players I mean that might as well be in Mandarin Chinese Conforto is too talented to be non-tender but if the financially challenged Will Ponds cannot sell the franchise which they're so bad they can't even do that. Could this hasten a trade of Conforto in the offseason as the Mets veer towards a less expensive 2021 outfield of J.D. Davis, Brandon Nimmo, and Jeff McNeil? What? That just seems like so far-fetched to me. That I'm not buying that. I mentioned the last dance earlier. I was hoping to review it in this episode, but uh, probably has to wait till the next one or maybe even the one after that. Um, but I do think they need to make a last dance doc about the 86 Mets. The only problem is it's not the last dance. Because that team had 87, 88, 89, and 90 pretty much as a unit, as a group together. I mean, for that run, you you had, you pretty much had, except for 90, you know, Keith, Carter, Straw, Mookie, Lenny, Ronnie, Backman, Hojo, oh boy, that would be fun. They they have to do it. They have to. Those guys are getting old enough now where it's like it doesn't matter what the fuck they they've done or did. It has to come out at some point. It has to. I just don't know who would be the Jordan. Like it, it obviously wouldn't be because he didn't have that one player that was the Michael Jordan that kind of carried the team really. I don't know. I would love to hear from Doc and Daryl. I mean, obviously they had their issues. It's so funny, like Doc and Daryl with Gary Carter, <laughs> and then Dykstra and Backman. What? 
what a crazy, crazy ass team. I mean, and, and the the pitching rotation, Doc, Ronnie, Sid, Ojeda. Who's the fifth? I feel like I'm I'm leaving out someone very important. Um, but then in the in the bullpen, my, Myers, McDowell, Orozco. I need to rewatch the eighty eight NLCS. I know it's I know we didn't win it, but I need to rewatch it because I feel like it, 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 the, it, I like I like pain. So there have been a lot of proposals thrown around by by Major League Baseball, and it, I don't I don't know. Now it, there are conflicting messages about like oh there's n- you know one guy is saying that there's no confidence that there's going to be a season. There's another guy saying pretty confident. There's at least going to be a 50 game season, which is kind of like, meh. but there is one proposal where, uh, I, I like it a lot and I think they should do it. And I think it follows a little bit of like the NBA format, maybe Eastern conference, Western conference. But, um, in the one proposal, who is this from? Is this Barstool? Yeah. I mean, Barstool didn't initially report it, but that's where I saw it. No American League or, N- or National League. And the East, I guess division you'd call it, would be Mets, Yankees, Red Sox, Nationals, Orioles, Phillies, Pirates, Blue Jays, Rays, Marlins. I, I don't know what the fuck the Pirates are doing in there, but why not? Um, Yeah, that should be like a full-time thing. I think that's awesome. I think that really uh be... Huge, because like interleague, we only see the Red Sox occasionally here and there. I really think Mets Red Sox would be would be cool to watch. Phillies Red Sox, obviously Mets Yankees, Phillies Yankees, Nats Orioles. I wish that was like better. I don't feel like that's ever a thing. There's also a simulated season, like BaseballReference.com has a simulated season from Out of the Park Baseball. I haven't checked this simulation in a while. Um. The only thing I've seen going forward is that the Pilonzo leads the league in home runs with 21. Back when I checked it before, uh, it turns out that Steven Matz and Rick Porcello were actually like top 10 pitchers. Steven Matz was like ninth in war. Porcello and Matz were two and three in ERA. Matz was third in whip. Porcello was sixth. It's like, hmm, interesting. And, of course, DeGrom was DeGrom. Conforto, Nimmo, McNeil, and Alonzo were offensive leaders, which leads me to believe that Cano actually died on the field due to his uh, road beef, as they call it, his side pieces, storming the field and beating him to death with cork bats injected with steroids. I don't know. <laughs> so that's Mets. Uh, there, I mean, I, I, I still think July 4th. I know I've said it so many times I'm a broken record, but July 4th, I really think it's going to happen. I know there was that fake message that said, oh, yeah, in June, we're going to have a, an abbreviated spring training, two, three weeks, and then uh, the league starts July 10th or something like that. Um, if the owners could get their heads out of their asses, it's billionaires versus millionaires. It's like whose side you're going to take. I guess you're going to take the side of the millionaires. I mean, you've already lost so much money now. Are you, are you willing to lose a lot more money and also – like drive drive the the divide between you and your players even more. Let's make it happen, Captain. 